It's been a while since I've been in front of this group, some familiar faces and uh, some new faces at the same time. Um, so I am David Bowen, I'm the director of the Central Region Office for the Department of Ecology. I've been with the agency for eight years now. I started in 2016 in water quality uh, in Union Gap office. I spent five years doing that, managing that team throughout the same seven rural um, central Washington counties. And then I went down to the nuclear waste program in Tri-Cities and was the program manager there for three years. And then uh, this position opened up and brought me back closer to home. I was doing that commute three days a week. It was a 200 mile round trip, uh, but it was, uh, it was still a challenging and rewarding job down there. But uh, my mom's here in town and my father passed away last June and my being an hour closer to home made a lot of sense to me. So I'm back uh, closer to home. Uh, my real role is to support the director out here in the region, kind of be your eyes, ears, and voice, and um, oversee the state's environmental work throughout the region. Uh, in our office, um, we respond to environmental issues impacting people's health, their livelihood, and their well-being, and uh, listening is a big part of that. So I, I generally don't speak a lot in meetings. I usually sit and listen, but um, I was told I need to fill 15 to 20 minutes, so we're going to do our best. Um, so listening is, is probably the most important thing that I can do. Um, that's how I learn what people need and how I can help. And when I get done here, I'm going to pass around some notepads and ask you guys to write down a few things that what your biggest concerns about climate, um, so I can have those in my mind and share them within the office down there. So I brought some pens and some pads I can send around. Uh, so my family and I have lived here in Ellensburg um, for well, I've been here for 55 years, and uh, my, my parents had a farm out in Badger Pocket, and I grew up working on my grandparents' farm uh, north of town, Alresa Creek. Um, we had a business up in Clayallum, too, so I've kind of been in all three regions of the, of the county as far as that goes. Uh, you know, we talk about climate change and the impacts. You know, as I was working on this presentation, I started thinking about the Taylor Bridge fire from 2012. And it may not necessarily have been exactly associated with climate change, but it was summer. It was right before the Ellensburg Rodeo, and things were really dry. Um, welders were working on the bridge. Uh, they were supposed to stop working early and have a spotter uh, because of the fire danger, but the, they didn't stop. They didn't have a spotter. And so the sparks from their work quickly ignited around the bridge, burned through 28,000 acres, more than 300 people, lost property, lots of livestock couldn't be saved. They had only what they took with them as they ran from the fire. Uh, so many lost everything, their homes, their futures, places they planned to settle down and retire. Some have rebuilt. Um, the bright spot in that is that so many county residents stepped up and supported those folks and gathered uh, places to take the livestock at the fairgrounds and the county engaged and made an emergency management center, all of that. So there's, there's always a bright spot, but we're seeing more and more of these situations across the state, like the Medical Lake Fire in Spokane last year. And we're going to continue to see problems like this more and more often. Um, so, you know, often we think of climate change as a looming threat, um, something in the future, but it's in our past, as I kind of just described, and it's our current reality. Uh, and one of those problems is how climate change is putting our shared water supply in real jeopardy. And I'm starting to tie it back to ag, which I thought, <laughs> which I was told was the cop. I'm getting, I'm getting there. So, um, so droughts no longer happen once a decade like they used to before 2015. Um, they're in an unprecedented pattern right now. We've had four statewide droughts in the last two decades, 2001, 2005, 2015, 2021, and many experts consider the 2015 one of the worst droughts on record. In between those years, um, other droughts impacted just parts of the state. Each of them has been hard on farms, ranches, wildlife, drinking water supplies. And I have neglected to tell you to move and change the slide. <laughs> Sorry. So Pat, you're keeping up. You did good. <laughs> so the year is Lake Kachitis in 2012. And then in the next slide, you'll see what uh, 2015 looked like. Oops. There we go. And so just major visual graphic of, of what the difference is. Um, and I'm not sure what slide we're on now. Is that five? I think so. So where are we headed? Um, by 2050, we expect 42% of the coming years in Washington to experience snow droughts. The amount of water coming out of the sky may not change. The timing and form of that water will. And that poses serious challenges for water storage and for irrigators counting on that water supply. 
We'll also continue seeing rising temperatures, more rain and less snow. This means there will be increased demand for water while supplies shrink. Um, currently, we've been in a drought since last July here in the central region. And, um, you know, last year we had a healthy snowpack uh, that melted away by a rapid May heat wave. It was the ninth driest year on record and even drier than 2015 when we had the major drought. Uh, the current drought declaration is supposed to end in June, but because our snowpack is so low, there's a good chance we'll extend it past June and expand it actually to more areas of the state, not just here. So we know this is a huge impact to life in Washington, especially here in Kittitas County. And, uh, you know, in, in that vein, we, we track what um, is coming out of the Bureau of Reclamation, where they've estimated the Yakima Dayton Basin will receive 72% of its normal water supply over a quarter less than usual. Just a prediction, it's early in the season, conditions could change quickly one way or the other, and uh, we're hoping that, it, that the temperatures up in the upper reaches stay cool and we get a little more snow back up there. Uh, but we're preparing for extended drought conditions regardless. We're advising people to get ready for a tough irrigation season and to remain mindful of how much water they use. And um, you know, the situation is serious, it sounds serious, um, and we'd be in trouble if we're, if we're not prepared to be able to do something. Uh, it's one of the most important challenges ecology is facing here in central Washington, to be honest. And well, there's a lot to worry about. There's important climate resilience work happening right here in Kittitas County. So I want to touch on some of the work that is going on and has been going on for quite some time. Uh, for starters, ecology is reintroducing an emergency drought well program. We land, last ran during the 2019 drought. And under this program, water users in the Yakima Basin can apply to pump from emergency wells if they're in a spot with enough groundwater. They'll provide mitigation to offset the full amount they plan to pump, and we're introducing a new tracking, new tracking requirements to make sure we're not overusing our finite water resources. So some of the regulations that you were talking about, there's going to be some uh, monitoring of uh, uh, flows on those wells as well. In the meantime, we're doing everything we can to protect flows for fish and reduce hardship on people in the Yakima Basin. Uh, this program is a small piece of what we're doing. We've been invested in the Yakima Basin for years. And those climate resilience projects are making a real difference. Uh, since 2006, Ecology's Office of the Columbia River has directed a half billion dollars into the Yakima and Columbia River basins. Our goal is finding creative ways to meet current and future water needs as things get hotter and drier. Uh, essentially, we are working to ensure that Central Washington has a livable, sustainable environment to support our communities for years to come. Collaboration and a shared vision are key to making this work. Uh, it, you know, we can't resolve things we're not talking about, and then when we start talking, we end up collaborating and finding solutions. So, uh, when it comes to positively changing course, I think local partnerships are some of the most promising pieces of our response to climate change. And one of those I'll just touch on is the Yakima Basin Integrated Plan. If you don't know what that is, the Integrated Plan is a coalition working on creative new ways to manage water supply in the Yakima ba Basin. Um, there are a lot of us working together on this, it's local governments, it's state and federal agencies, environmental groups, irrigation districts, and the Yakima Nation, just to name a few. And you've got them on the screen, you are so good. <laughs> uh, the group has earned a national reputation as a model to use throughout the country, and one of the things it's known for is the high level of trust, collaboration, and communication between its members. Um, that's how it's possible for the integrated plan to take on ambitious projects and keep its commitments to the people, environment, and economy of the Yakima Basin. Uh, slide nine, please. There's a long list of projects, including some truly groundbreaking work like the first in the nation fish passage project up at Clay Elm Dam. Another is purchasing the Springwood Ranch property where a new reservoir will help set aside water for fishing farmers. And there's a lot of details on that property. It's a huge collaboration among agencies, including Kittitas County, um, and being able to keep some of that in a working farm while um, putting that additional water storage in there. Uh, the rest of the projects throughout the Yakima Basin, big and small, they help to restore vital habitat, work with irrigation districts to conserve water, repair aging water infrastructure, and replenish aquifers. Without these efforts, the droughts we've experienced in the last several years would have been even more devastating for fishing irrigators. Uh, so these efforts are well worth our time and investment. We are very grateful for the partnerships that make this possible, including the Kittitas Reclamation District, the Yakima Nation, Kittitas County, and many other local governments. And I can't emphasize enough, every dollar we invest in drought response and water management in the Yakima Basin is an investment in the future of this region. These projects are paving a pathway to prosperous, responsible growth while caring for communities and lands in the basin. Next slide. 
<clears throat> this is the heart of our climate response, local collaborative work where we can dig in and see a day-to-day -day difference. The Yakima Basin is also one puzzle piece in our statewide plans and be assured that there are things happening at an even larger level. For example, last year the legislature gave Ecology $3 million in emergency drought funds. We've distributed that money as drought response grants for communities, irrigation districts, tribes, and local government agencies. They also provided, they being the legislature, um, $2 million for drought planning and preparedness. We're putting that in competitive grants for local jurisdictions so they can better prepare for drought. The application period just closed last week and we anticipate issuing uh, the grants this summer. So those grants, the communities can use these funds to create local drought plans. Um, this way they can identify the actions, costs, and timelines that they need to improve the security of water supplies. And we hope this is the start of a long-term effort to support local governments as they mitigate the worst effects of climate change. Under our current drought declaration, the Yakima Nation and irrigation districts also qualify for federal drought relief funds. While these drought efforts are one-time funding opportunities, we're on our fourth annual round of stream flow restoration grants. The application period closed just last month. This year, there's $40 million available for public entities, irrigation districts, tribes, and nonprofits. Uh, we're prioritizing that we're prioritizing projects that keep water flowing through our rivers and streams. And historically, we've funded water rights acquisitions, water storage, riparian and habitat risk improvements, floodplain restoration projects. So together, these projects help weave a strong net to protect our state. And this project crop progress has been encouraging. I'm glad to see the state invest in places like Kittitas County. Uh, another piece, uh, next slide. Um, and we start getting the differing opinions probably over this section, but I'm very good. I need to cover it. There's another piece we're moving along that is good news for our climate response, and that's the state's climate resilience strategy. At a high level, this strategy coordinates across multiple state agencies to prioritize the biggest needs and lessen the impacts of climate change on the people of Washington. And our priority is to build off what we already are doing and improve how we address climate change impacts um, like heat and smoke and drought. The goal is to protect public health, restore habitats, and cultivate healthy agricultural lands and forests. We also need to do all that in a way that meets the unique needs of different communities. Some communities are already experiencing outsized impacts from climate change, such as wildfires or extreme heat. They don't have the resources or support to withstand those risks, let alone recover from them. Uh, we're trying to close that gap by identifying the highest climate risk and who's most vulnerable to them. It's helps us to ensure that all areas of our state are equipped to meet those challenges, whether by providing specific funding and support or solving unique regional challenges. For our region, I hope that this will help with, our, with air quality and worker protections from the wildfires and heat we know are getting worse and happening more often. This will especially be important for the many agricultural and outdoor workers here who already experience disproportionate barriers to environmental health and safety. Uh, I mentioned before collaboration is key, and um, with that, we need your help on this. Uh, our final um, strategy on resilience is, uh, will be done this fall, but in June, we're releasing the draft and want your feedback to make it work better. So please watch for that and provide any comment. Um, maybe we missed something, maybe, maybe you have some ideas that aren't included. Uh, next slide. There are a lot of positive changes happening that are reassuring in the face of all the climate impacts Kittitas County has seen. There's one more that I'd like to mention today. Uh, we're continuing to see refinements with the Climate Commitment Act to make it work better for farmers. This year, the legislature set aside $30 million to help farmers who haven't received fuel exemptions under the Climate Commitment Act, meaning they've had to pay extra fees they weren't supposed to might be charged in the first place. So under the law, agricultural fuels are exempt from any fees fuel companies might pass on to customers to cover the cost of their pollution allowances, but some fuel suppliers were still charging farmers, so we're looking for a way to get them. Uh, um, we've worked with suppliers and farmers to address those issues, including providing farmers rebates to use when they purchase these fuels. So we continue to work with the agricultural community to come up with more solutions, uh, so there's, there'll be more, more to come. Um, so everything I've shared, then uh, slide 13, please. Everything I've shared is just a portion of the complex work in front of us, but the most important thing to remember is that there's a lot to be hopeful for, even with the challenges ahead. So much of that is happening right in our backyards, and the people making that possible are our neighbors, friends, and leaders. And I have a few examples as I kind of wrap this up. Um, the Kittitas Reclamation District has really stepped up. Uh, big thanks that goes out to Urban Everhart, the district manager. 
Um, KRD has been working with people throughout the region to improve habitat and water quality, keep water in streams, and keep the water cool for fish. <coughs> Another one that's often overlooked is the Kittitas County Conservation District. They, for decades, have been working to improve irrigation efficiencies. Uh, they're another driving force in the county that is setting us on the right path. Um, and specifically, I want to call out Anna Lale, who's now the district manager. She's worked for the Conservation District uh, almost 30 years now, but her persistence in this program has made it this all fly. And as you see those circles and different irrigation systems out in the field, that's mostly from Anna and her team's work. And then at Ecology, I owe a lot to Tom Tebb, who is the Director of Ecology's Office of the Columbia River, and that's for spearheading our water supply investments in the Yakima Basin. And uh, to Derek Sanderson, which many of you may know, who was once in my role, also in Tom's position, and now heads the Department of Agriculture. Um, he led so much of the key water supply work that supports farmers and ranchers today. And then uh, I'd be remiss in not mentioning that we're grateful to Yakima Nation and Tribal Partners for their long continued stewardship of the land and natural resources we rely on. Next slide. So Kittitas County and the Yakima River Basin are leading the way in showing the rest of Washington what a sustainable, resilient future can look like. Um, this is some of the most important work we can spend our time on, and we're counting on your continued help to move forward. Um, and so the interactive portion that I mentioned earlier is Listening is the most important part of my job, and um, I'm going to pass around some note notepads, and if you could write down the top climate issues in our region that are on your mind, um, what we want to know what matters to you, and we'll look at what you put down and see if there are patterns we can address or incorporate into what we do. So I'll stop there, and I know I just blew through that, so I don't know if you want to do questions or do the presentations or what you want to do. Well, thank you. That was that. We do have time for questions from anyone who has them. So let's go ahead and does anyone have questions? Go ahead. Uh, oh, oh Scott. Scott. You mentioned the Climate Commitment Act and some Recording of the Recording stuff. Can you repeat the question a little bit after they ask it just so we can hear it on here? Sure. Okay, thanks. So the question. Yeah. The question is, the Climate Commitment Act, money is from that is coming to local growers. The, the Climate Commitment Act is under fire and might be overturned uh, because of this initiative or referendum. How much money went, is going to the farmers through that source? Uh, you kind of blew through that quickly. Okay, got it. So the question was around the Climate Commitment Act. There is an initiative out right, right now to repeal that act. And the question was associated with how much of them, how much funding is going to the farmers. And the specific item that I brought up was $30 million uh, for anybody who ended up having to pay taxes on the fuel they were using for farming purposes uh, that they shouldn't have because the farming uh, fuel was supposed to be exempt from the fees charged from the Commitment Act. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Oh, oh, cool. And so if that um, initiative passes and portions of the CCA will go away or all of it, and how will that, will that mean the money, that 30 million will just be done? It's a really great question and I can't specifically answer it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's some legislation that's baked in and the legislators are the ones who passed the Climate Commitment Act and then the governor signed it into law. Um, and I don't think that the legislature has changed over enough to where if it is repealed, if pieces of it won't get brought up again and additional legislation passed, that'd be the most likely thing that would happen. Maybe not all of it would be in place. Um, we just did a sale of, um, of credits you know, a week or so ago. And because of the uncertainty of whether this Climate Commitment Act is going to stay in place or not, the price did drop in half. Um, co companies aren't investing in that as, as strongly as they were when they felt like they were actually going to have to have to have them. So some of them are hedging a little bit on how much they're going to spend on them right now while they wait out this initiative. So, you know, the funding's going to ebb and flow, uh, but what we have, we're definitely going to get out and you know, put it to good use in the communities. And as I tried to thread through here, any community driven is always the best. Every time an agency tries to drive a project through without community buy-in, it tends not to work very well. Oh, 
will get stepped on. Who is behind the initiative to repeal this act? I honest, I haven't watched it close enough to answer that. I'm not exactly sure. Um, I'm, I would assume the, the fuel industry itself is probably the major push, but I don't know if they have an individual who's out in the front as a spokesperson or not. Yeah, that's a great question, and it actually, that development came through when I was a county commissioner. Um, and it was in the urban growth area of the city of Ellensburg. And, you know, at the time, the regulations counted on the developer. If you want to make the investment, you need to know whether it's billable or not. And if you have uh, water issues or flood issues, uh, you know, that's on you. It's not on the, the county or the city to cover that. Um, and so that was just a sign of the times. You know, it was 15, 16 years ago when that um, development was put in place. At the time, the county was going through huge growth. There was a lot of pressure to stop the rural three acre, four acre development and try and focus it in the urban growth areas. This was in an urban growth area. So at the time, it made more sense to go ahead and approve that. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of that buyer beware situation. Um, associated with that particular development on, and how the regulations were written at the time. It would have been a beautiful um, environmental wetlands park for schools in the area, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Any other questions? Mike? Well, I'll probably come to uh, see you again. I'll probably contact you later about the details of this. If you'll accept the park, that sounds argumentative. I'll, I'll just rush through it because it's really scenario thing to see if is there time to make the adjustment if it was called for upon your reassessment. What I see them doing in our area is they they decided politically which land they could run a project through to fish or you know flash control. They decided politically and then they did all the studies that are a little bit cryptic to see. And then they said well to acquire the land, let's slap a fake white land and a really wide uncalled for flood plan and, and not budge, just not budge until it. And so I'm very sympathetic to ecology and I'm pretty smart to have a lot of biology coursework. So I'm thinking, if my if that scenario was true here or in some other scenario, will there be time to reassess, just leave that one alone and say, Let's, uh, instead of choosing politically, let's choose ecologically, which is the best place for our projects. Is there still time to do that? When you say projects, are you talking about habitat restoration type projects? Or are you talking say, about for example, subdivisions? I want to make sure I've got the right context. I think so. Well, this goes through the urban growth area, and it's, it's a pretty scant little amount of water coming down from the Nanofood Waste Creek. But in, in the more general sense, I, I'm convinced that that's what I described. Most of those elements are what happened. But it doesn't look to me as if it fits all the things I know. They're really trying to force it, not design with nature, but force it through because that's where they could get the land and they thought we'd be pushovers and wouldn't mind. Why don't you give up half of your, half of your family fortune for our little project? And all, all we'll do is, here's the bad part, and I'll leave it there. I'm asking, is there anywhere where they can say, you know, for the public, for perpetuity, let's pay fair market value and put things where the ecology really calls for it. And I guess I, I lost a little, a little bit of what I was going to ask. <laughs> but that's probably enough for the moment. It sounds argumentative, but imagine if it were true somewhere in Washington. Is anybody saying, you know, let's reassess where we chose our project politically rather than based on the actual land? Yeah, you're getting into land use decision making, which is the local government's determination. Mm -hmm. Ecology has um, RCWs and WAX developed from, from those, the laws the legislature passes that we uh, do our best to apply to a particular project or a particular location. 
Yeah, that, that it would be interesting to see if the local governments would ever got to the point where they could take into consideration the existing environment uh, more so than it is done now. Um, they kind of told me that's what they did in some ways, but I'm saying these elements are present. I can show that they know the floodplain is completely wrong and that the wetland is completely wrong, but they use these as political maneuvers. That, that they, I would study this a long time, sort of trying to negotiate with them, but kind of trying to catch them after a while. <laughs> so my point is, if you say, well, we've got to leave that up to the locals, I'm saying, does at some point is somebody saying, come on, we're not trying to spank you guys or put you in prison, but don't do that. In fact, we're going to have to fix this because of what you did. Are we gonna, is somebody able? Is that in this system at the moment? Yeah, do that, something like that. Is there an ombudsman I could have called? Yeah, no, the authorization to do something like that is not in the, on the books for ecology to step in in that matter uh, on projects. Um, but you know what that says? Well, that I says think they're I wielding think authority without science being preeminent. Pre 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 yeah. We're going to need to be <laughs> They will, and but they wielding, wielding authority without using science in ecology. It's got to be the science, not the ecology. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Many things we can discuss about that. Yeah, We're going to move on now to Dr. Ostrom's talk. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I am Marcia Ostrom, the director of the statewide food systems program at Washington State University, and also a professor in the school of the environment. It is Great to see all of you here to engage with these critical issues. I was asked by the organizer, organizers of this forum uh, to talk about positive actions that are underway to strengthen agricultural and food systems and economies um, in response to climate change. Uh, but first, I, well first I thought David Huggins was going to provide all of the graphs and overviews because normally we have to do a lot of graphs about climate change, but we'll just count on what you just heard from uh, David here. Um, but I wanted to tell you just a little bit about the history and mission of the program that I direct so that you can understand the context for my observations. The WSU Food Systems Program was actually created by people like you. Our program was established back in 2000 by the Washington State Legislature in response to citizen organizing and lobbying. Citizens were requesting more programs at our WSU College of Agriculture, our Land Grant University, that focused on sustainable agriculture, uh, served small and diversified farms, partnered with tribal colleges, and supported the development of community-based food systems. So I applied for this job right out of graduate school, thinking it was well, it was. It was about the only one like it in the country at that time. So um, thanks to the citizens of Washington, we have this program at our Land Grant University. Our program uh, integrates multidisciplinary ex expertise. We work across the teaching, research, and extension arms of our Land Grant University, uh, working to build sustainable food and farming systems through education and research. Our mission has evolved over the years, but it's remained fairly consistent. Um, you can find it on our website, uh, foodsystems.wc.edu. Uh, but our mission, in summary, is to partner with diverse farmers and communities throughout the state to regenerate healthy agroecosystems, support thriving food and farm businesses, and develop harvesting, processing, and distribution systems that ensure equitable access to quality and culturally appropriate foods for all Washington citizens. So as we have seen and heard about, and not as much as we might have from, um, had David Huggins been here, um, we have seen global disruptions already. Uh, we've seen the pandemic, we've seen droughts and wildfires. Um, these are presenting unprecedented challenges to the sustainability of Washington's food and farming system. So our program and our university colleagues and all of us have our work cut out for us. Climate-driven events such as flooding, water shortages, farm reduced snowpacks, extended heat events, and wildfires have and will continue to impact the ability of farmers to earn a living and to provide a healthy and stable food supply for our communities. 
We know that we can expect growing unpredictability with our climate, and we've already had a taste of what a heat dome feels like, especially here in central Washington, and experienced what it's like to have wildfire and smoke and seeing farmers and farm workers having to work out in extended smoke and heat. We've also just experienced a pandemic and seen the social, political, and environmental fallout from that. So, so what have we learned? <laughs> what have we learned about the resilience of our agriculture and food systems in the face of these unprecedented challenges? Well, perhaps um, most poignantly, the pandemic highlighted the vulnerabilities in our Washington food systems. We saw the um, we saw deepened inequities in access to food. We saw high rates of food insecurity up to 50 to 58 percent in lower income communities and communities of color and in households with children. Unfortunately, these high levels of food insecurity have persisted um, in our state into the present time. The pandemic also exacerbated a labor shortage that impacted on farm production, harvesting, processing, distribution of marketing, many markets closed down completely. The, the results were widespread, widespread supply chain and market disruptions, and everyone working in agriculture seems to have a story to tell. I have frequently heard statements such as, I could grow it, but I just couldn't sell it. Paradoxically though, these challenges are also creating new opportunities, and that's what I'm going to talk about. All of a sudden, now, a lot more people are asking, how can we feed ourselves from our region in a more secure way? Here in central Washington, we're surrounded by some of the most productive farmland in the, in the country, if not in the world. We have incredible farming infrastructure, many, many talented farmers here, including a next and coming generation of immigrant farmers who are eager to farm. But we have also learned that it takes whole communities and policies to support the well-being of these farmers. What is new at this time is that we are seeing more powerful movements for change that are inspired by both farmers and consumers, perhaps for different reasons. In the face of climate challenges, farmers of all sizes and types are turning towards the use of resource conserving and regenerative farming practices as ways to improve their resilience in the face of climate vagaries. They're working on soil building, water conservation, irrigation management, as David just said. They're interested in crop diversity, genetic diversity, diversifying their markets. Some of the things we've been preaching for decades, all of a sudden, everybody's interested in it. And simultaneously, we're seeing increased momentum to strengthen regional food sourcing on the demand side and to build more coordinated food supply chains. Some of us are calling these combined efforts a movement towards circular food systems. These are food systems that close ecological loops at multiple levels from the farming system through the processing, distribution, food consumption, and waste. Circular food systems optimize natural resource use and genetic crop diversity on farms, they minimize waste, including greenhouse gases, gas emissions, they, they, they sequester carbon, they promote human health, food security, and community well-being, and they offer healthy and culturally prefer, preferred food choices. They also return nutrients and organic waste back to the soil where they came from. Can be, these, these circular food systems can be modeled at multiple levels. Our colleagues in Europe are modeling these at a global level, but we've been looking more local and regional level here. Circular food systems, in other words, can be structured to optimize food quality and consumer health while minimizing waste, including greenhouse gases, sequestering carbon, and reducing fossil fuel consumption, thereby closing loops all the way along the food supply chain from the producers to the distributors to the eaters. As I've traveled the state, I've been hearing stories over and over from farmers about how they are changing their farming systems to become more resilient and reduce waste and emissions. They're also selecting seeds and crop varieties that can better survive a changing climate. For example, we have a weed breeder at WSU who's building what he calls climate smart wheat, a wheat seed mix that you can plant and then see how it does. <laughs> and when it, you save the seeds and then you have the seeds that are going to do better in your new climate that you now have. So we have um, 
a lot of innovation going on. Farmers trying to stay agile and figure out how they're going to still produce their crops under change of, changing climates. On the marketing side, we're seeing farmers and food hubs um, aggregating their products. Uh, they learned during the pandemic that they could count on local consumers when their wholesale markets closed. We have uh, many stories about restaurants closing, export markets closing, and groups of farmers turning to local consumers to sell their products through CSAs or food boxes. Also, critically important has been the emergency food system. So, as I said, the downside of this is that we're seeing high rates of food insecurity. The upside of this is that, is that our federal farm bill food nutrition assistance programs, such as food stamps, now called EBT, um, can offer can be accepted by farmers and farmers markets and food hubs uh, as payment for farm products. And we also have local community groups that have been matching these dollars from federal nutrition assistance programs, such as Rotary Clubs. So, for example, if you go to the farmers market and you have a, a EBT card that's worth forty dollars. The Rotary Club might match you with another forty dollars, so you can have eighty dollars to spend at the farmers market. And farmers are saying these these kinds of programs have constituted up to thirty percent of their income stream. So, this is, these are programs that are both trying to address food security and also supporting our local farm resilience. Uh, food hubs in our state have also been a way to aggregate and distribute farm products to into larger markets and scale up. Um, farming markets that are more agile and adaptable and can, uh, well, it's not easy when you lose a whole sort of college cafeteria <laughs> to COVID, but they have been able to um, market products in a, in a more regional based supply chain and find new markets when we've had challenges. Um, so we're seeing new processing and storage infra infrastructure as a result of the COVID relief funds. Our state has managed to direct um, uh, what's called the Regional Food Infrastructure Grants to our local processing and storage infrastructure. So for example, the little town of Chihuahua just built a new community creamery that can support eight dairies where we didn't have any milk processing other than dairy gold in the state. We have a new, uh, new meat processing equipment and infrastructure because farmers haven't been able to get their meat products to consumers in a local way without sort of driving across a, a couple state lines um, to get inspected meat facilities. So we, have, we see um, some of the federal and state aid going to address critical gaps in the food system. Um, we've, we've had these gaps for a long time, but people have just, um, I think, now become more aware of the fact that it's sometimes impossible to buy local farm products. Um, the conservation districts have been continued to distribute um, equip funds for to build hoop houses that help a season extension, which is going, going to be more and more important when you can predict the climate. Um, they also uh, are working on the irrigation efficiencies and ha can help provide um, assistance for farmers who want to improve their irrigation systems. They ha um, we also have federal money going to support farm to school and farm to cafeteria programs that in state money, um, these markets were largely shut down during COVID, so they had to rebuild, um, and they weren't easy to begin with, but small part of an institutional market can be a fairly large income for a farmer. And we're also seeing um, incredible growth in interest in indigenous food sovereignty programs on the part of tribes. We just had a food sovereignty summit over in Idaho for the Northwest, and I think 400 people came, um, and there's a new, uh, well not new, but newly invigorated food sovereignty network for Northwest and Northwest tribes. Um, they're teaching 4-H programs and educational programs with traditional hunting, fishing, and food harvesting techniques, working on restoring native plants, waterways, and ecosystems. Some tribes have hired farmers to grow fresh produce for their um, school food programs, and their preschools, and their um, elder centers, um, tribal governments are interested in making land and infrastructure available for food and farming, entrepreneurs from the tribe. Um, here, close to here we have the Yakima Nation's tribal farm. I'm not sure if you all are aware of that, but um, the Yakima Nation has acquired one of our largest organic vegetable farms in the state, um, and now they're going to use it to supply the tribe, and it has been part of the emergency food system. This, Farm supplies an incredible amount of vegetables. So, 
it'll be interesting to see what the Yakima Nation does with that, but hopefully they can use it to improve their nutrition as well as their economy. Uh, we had a new program called We Feed Washington that has allowed um, lo local emergency food banks and networks uh, to purchase directly from local guards and deliver it to food insecure households and reservations. Again, farmers have been saying that these programs have been critical for their economic well-being. Um, our, on the farm side, we're seeing that existing farmers and new farmers really want to learn how to have more environmentally and economically sustainable farming systems and marketing systems, as do tribal food harvesters. Our education programs in sustainable agriculture have been full. We have hundreds of farmers coming through our classes a year and coming to our on-farm workshops. Farmers want to learn from other farmers who have figured out how to be innovative, but they also want university research and extension directed at the problems they're facing, including what crop varieties can do well and change climate conditions and how to build resilient soils that can support stronger plant health. Um, as well as that we are also having students study uh, organic and sustainable agriculture as undergraduates and graduates, and then we're trying to place them in internships around the state. So we're also seeing um, increased partnerships with our food systems team at WSU, with government agencies, with gardening programs, with technical assistance and on-farm research. So I think it's an interesting time because of, of all of these crises we've faced. It's, it's kind of inspired a lot of new thinking and innovation and learning. So I guess that's the upside of it. Um, we have extension offices throughout the state. Every county, you have an extension office here. Extension has a long history. In fact, was founded to build the viability of agriculture and um, support good nutrition in communities. Um, we would encourage you to get more involved if you're not already with your local extension system. We have growing groceries programs, food preservation programs, gardening programs. Um, we get some money from the food stamp, the SNAP Ed program to provide nutrition education, but we don't have a lot anymore. There used to be someone who would teach canning and freezing in every extension office and food safety. Those positions no longer exist. We do have master gardeners who can help with community gardens and gardening, which is more a volunteer-based program. And we also just got a new federal grant that was also inspired by the problems across the food food and ag system um, in recent years. It, these are called Northwest Food Business Center, or US, United States Department of Agriculture Food Business Centers. We got funding for a Northwest Regional Food Business Center that includes our six state region, and I'm the lead for Washington. And these are five, this is a five year program to fund the business development to improve farm business viability and food business viability um, all the way from the farm to the eater. So. We are going to have business builder grants um, to help with farm infrastructure and business planning and as well as more te technical assistance available for farms to develop sustainable business plans. So those are just some of the things that I just wanted to tell you about that um, it seems like we've had a lot of downers but maybe it's inspired some new learning and um, re renewed interest in how we can make our, our food systems more reliable and sustainable at a regional level. What can you do? Um, assuming that you all are interested in strengthening your food supply and your uh, participation in our food system, um, I, I believe that a wider transition to agricultural sustainability can only happen if people beyond the farmers get involved. It can't just be the farmers building these agroecologically based farming systems on their own. It requires a full community of support that can support access to farming resource, resources, water, knowledge, development, markets, and the infrastructure needed. And this is where this circularity comes in because it really requires building relationships that are fully networked within a region. In Europe, uh, we say food supply chains in Europe, they're calling these net chains because they aren't actually linear. They're like reciprocal relationships that uh, support between farmers and consumers. So as an individual, you can learn more about where your food dollars are going and how to make the most effective use of them. In this region, we have the Washington Food and Farm Finder map supported by Eat Local First on my sticker here. Um, if you go to that website, Eat Local First, it's pretty easy. You just pull it up and you can see who some of your local farms are that are, are looking for local buyers. 
I think they're probably seven or so listed in this region. You can um, learn more about your local farmer's markets. I don't know how, how many of you shop regularly at a farmer's market, but we have done some research here. Uh, your closest ones are Ellensburg, I guess, Roslyn and Yakima. Those, those uh, we've paid for some research on those markets. Those are markets that really do support farmers. I think between those three markets, you probably have 50 farmers who are counting on that income for their living, some of them earning thousands of dollars at a market. And, and I've met many farmers who earn their full living at the farmer's market, especially even in these rural areas. We think it's just the big urban markets, but it's not true. We even have some farmers who just earn their entire living in one farmer's market. <laughs> so um, they're not just cute, they're not just fun. I mean, they are fun, but they really are important for farmers to earn a living. Um, we, what else can you do? Well. So those are some of the things, and then I'm going to talk about some things at a policy level, but as a community, um, what we're seeing that's interesting is communities looking at their uh, public institutions and where those food dollars are going, because it's a significant amount of dollars um, from, say, a central university. We, we did manage to redirect some of our um, WSU cafeteria buying towards the Link Food Hub that um, a little bit uh, disturbed during COVID, but we're hoping to rebuild. But I mean, even a small amount of an institutional food system is can be a, a large economic stream for a group of farmers. Um, and and then I, I just can't you know say enough to stay involved with your county extension offices and at a at a policy level work to make sure that extension is supported so that we can have adequate staffing at county and state levels both to provide farming education and sustainable farming practices and also to educate consumers about nutrition and healthy eating and community economic development has historically been a function of extension. So in conclusion, I, I just wanted to restate that we have learned a lot from our recent experiences. Um, in order to have more resilient food systems, we know that we need to have regionally coordinated food supply chains with appropriate processing and distribution infrastructure. We need to support ecological and market diversity at the farm level. Not every variety or every crop is going to be suited to our new climate realities. We need to build soil health in order to conserve water and strengthen plant health. And then we need, as David is talking about, efficient water use and equitable distribution and community planning. Um, we have, to, we have to address our persistent food insecurity and low-income households. But ideally, um, programs that address food insecurity can also um, use, make the money work harder by also going to local farmers to provide produce to those families and healthy quality foods. And then um, we need to continue these investments in infrastructure and market development. I, I don't know why it took a pandemic to do it, because we've known about this for a long time, but it's really making a difference. Like when I go around the state, I hear it, I see it. Um, so these programs have been really effective and I'm worried what happens when we get to the end of the COVID relief money um, and we stop making these kinds of investments. So I think, you know, there's a will in our state to continue some of these programs, especially the ones that address food insecurity. They've proven their effectiveness. So I just say as, you know, food citizens, we can stay involved and pay attention uh, to these programs and the impacts that they're having for both our farmers and our um, insecure community members. Our um, website is foodsystems.wcu.edu if you want to check out our program, your program, um, and tell us what you need or sign up for any of our listservs, newsletters, or learn more about these USDA food business centers. Thank you very much for having me talk and uh, look forward to hearing any questions you might have. This is just the beginning of a conversation we need to have on a regular basis about agriculture in this community, about climate change, about how we can participate to get what we want. And I think your ideas are fantastic. OK, questions? Uh, when Shockey's closed, that was our avatar. And uh, farmers around here, there's a lot of beef growers and pork growers, not maybe a lot of pork growers, but people who raise animals, but they have to take them way across the state to find a certified, you know, avatar.
repertoire. So is there any plan for to the past uh, county uh, getting something like that? Please? I think, um, I don't know precisely what they're doing, but I've heard that Greenbow Farm is developing some processing infrastructure on a farm that may be available to other producers. Okay. Um, but I have, I mean, these are tough, these are tough issues. Um, I will say one great thing is that WCU has started our butcher training program again, because we've actually been short people who have the skills to do butchering and slaughtering in our state, and a lot of our custom slaughters are aging out and we don't have enough um, USDA inspective facilities. We don't have state inspection in our state, so that's a challenge because in a lot of states that's what keeps the small mid-scale meat processing going. So we have to have USDA inspection, but we have um, managed to get that for some smaller community-based facilities and mobile units. So I think we've carved out the paths um, but some of the solutions are community by community. Um, up way up in Colville, they got together and built a community-owned meat processing facility that has eventually um, been bought by private owners. But they have um, they have a facility up there that's USDA inspected. We have one on San Juan Island that Extension helped develop back in 2004, a small mobile slaughter unit that's paired up with a cut and wrap facility that's a cooperative. So there are solutions, but um, there hard work. You know, most of, a lot of our land around here is grown for uh, Japanese paper. Or mm, right. It's like, you know, we can't do that. Uh, so, <laughs> I, I don't know if there's any encouragement there in, in transitioning into food because the shortages are going to be worse and worse and worse. Well, luckily if you go outside your county, you have really productive farms. You might need to think regionally here. Because, you know, those hay markets are, I don't think they're, I don't know, maybe they're going to go away, I don't know. As long as those markets are there, it's going to be, you know, farmers are just trying to survive and earn a living, so they need to go where the markets are. As a result of good hay, though, you do have a lot of good livestock and meat. Yeah. So, you know, you have... Have you seen a film called uh, 100,000 Meeting Parts by Will Harris? Do you know what you mean? I haven't seen it. Yeah, he's a, a farmer out of Lufton, Georgia. He, he owns a lot of acreage that so he can manage this, but I had an idea for Tinnitus County. If you had adjacent farmland, you know, someone could do chickens and have them mobile, and someone could do beef and move them, because you have to move mm -hmm. your animals yeah. around. And sheep and, you know, whatever. And you should watch that. It's only 15 oh, cool. minutes of uh, time. I'd write it down and take a look at it, because he's got the science. You know, he just went back to... Grandpa and grandma and the old way to do things actually, you know. Yeah, I love that. Neighboring farms cooperating. Yeah, and, and, and uh, uh, graze sheep and cattle together because they have they help each other with the kind of intestinal issues that they have because they're different. I mean some don't like sheep and the other one doesn't like cattle, so you know, they, he he has he has figured out how to uh, quit using so much uh, medicine and things like that on mm -hmm. his animals, and he's, he's organic, and it's just, it's beautiful what he does, you know. So much to learn about pasture-based systems. <laughs> and you do have your extension person here, Tristan Hudson, is a forage management expert, so he yeah, probably knows more about it than... How would you organize uh, farmers in the county, people with land, to... <laughs> To, to do that with each other. That seems like it yeah. might be very hard. Farmers will do what they want to do, but <laughs> we have seen <laughs> We have seen <laughs> We have seen this in some areas like Skagit County, some of the dairy farmers I mean, are working with nearby crop farmers. Some of the marketing he does, he wastes nothing. He's got a he he takes yeah. all those hides, he's got leather things for selling. Yeah. It's, it's beautiful the innovation that's out there and there are definitely farmers who wanna learn learn about that from other farmers. Yeah. So, you know, it's part of our job in extension to make sure that we make that knowledge available, like what, you know, the kinds of ideas that you're talking about. And how, how is your program uh, supporting local growers, farmer market growers here in the Kintetsu? Well, so we work closely with the State Farmers Market Association, and you're the, um, I'm not sure what they call it, I guess it's the executive director, Colleen Donovan, is from here. She lives here in Ellensburg, and she used to work for me as my farmer's market specialist. So she's doing a great job organizing a whole, the whole association of farmer's markets and providing te technical expertise and capacity building to each of the markets. So I would say that's been our best asset. We're um, one of the few states to have an association of farmer's markets, and they provide guidelines and professional development for managers to make it um, so that they're managed more professionally. 
And we do research with them just to try to understand well, the market. Hang on, just so oh, I was just interested in how you support the farmers. Not the farmers? Yeah. So the I, farmers, when man, I hear from them, they, yeah. they don't get the money. The big corporate farmers get the money. At the farmers markets? No, no. Oh, I don't think so. USDA, you know, yeah. all those grants. They, they don't really seem to be supporting small farmers. Well, some of these new programs are targeted specifically to small and mid-scale operations. I so sense, that's exciting. I sense that yeah, David yeah, Cohen know. would like to pass out his <laughs> question. <like>, <laughs> <laughs> I am asking, are there other questions for uh, Dr. Ostrom? Mm -hmm. All right, let's pass out that questionnaire. Yeah, it's just blank notepads, and I'm looking for you know your top two climate concerns um, associated with your region. 